Hello, my name is Adam Bean, and uh, it's the first Monday of the month, uh, 6 uh, p.m. CST or CAT, Central European Time. So, uh, welcome to 67th uh, EHEX TV, and let's start with the uh, questions or content. So, since the last episode, I recorded or published several podcast episodes. One is somehow relevant to transactions. There would be one question regarding transaction and threats. So, what we did here, um, Andre. Um, I think Andre, I pronounce this right, um, uh, um, mentioned on Twitter had some um, had some feedback uh, to to a um, episode regarding microprofile transaction, and we had a, I would say somehow deep dive regarding transaction threats and what what happens behind the scenes on application server. Then uh, also interesting, a very brief uh, or short episode with Dashner. What I was curious about how the Code One conference was this year. And uh, I couldn't attend uh, because of workload. And actually, <laughs> I missed the deadline uh, submitting abstracts. This was the, the actual problem. <laughs> but anyway, both um, um, workload was the um, was uh, was also um, uh, problematic. And uh, so we had a chat, you know, Java One versus Code One, and uh, um, what the impressions of uh, Code One conference actually are. And um, also related to the show, I got a questions regarding OData, and I was able to talk with uh, Apache PMC Michael Boltz uh, about OData. So what OData is, is the open data protocol, and there is one um, open source implementation called Apache Olingo, and uh, it is like a backend for frontend, so it is really usable API, which comes with predefined REST API, where you can query data sources, like for instance database. So we had chat about that. And um, also, um, we had <laughs> a chat with uh, Dimitri Kornilov uh, about uh, Jason B. So uh, and uh, Helidon. And um, I was curious about Helidon, about the micro profile framework Holy, um, um, Helidon. Um, yeah, this um, happened um, the last month. And um, other thing is, I got uh, lots of registrations to the uh, web um, workshop. So what I actually um, what I think I will do, I think it's possible that you will code all the time with me, so we will provide more smaller examples for the web part. This is not always possible in the backend because there is a, um, we do a lots of you know uh, NoSQL servers and the new stuff, and as well uh, with the cloud, so it's not as easy you know to set up a cloud. But um, I think in the um, uh, micro pro microservices, of course, and in the web parts, you will code a lot with me. So um, all the workshops are going to take place. So if you like, register. Um, so we have the largest room in the uh, Java part, and I'm not not sure about the web part, but um, this is the nicest room with three beamers, so almost 360. Could be AirHex 360. Okay, now we have it. First question. And I don't know whether it's a question. This is like Quarkus GSF. So if I click on it, uh, I go to a login page, to the chat. So um, I think Tony Herstel would like to know from me what's my opinion about Quarkus GSF. And I would say if Quarkus will come with JSF, it could be actually uh, nice because uh, with JSF is still really productive. You build, um, uh, I would say, how to call it, um, straight uh, CRUD interfaces. So JSF is just uh, yeah, uh, way to go. So it could be interesting to ship uh, Quarkus with JSF. So if you if this is the question, so this is the answer. The next one, guys, guys on Fonter. Uh, ask me, um, currently we deploy dozens of wars on a single Java EE6 application server. So Java is 6 I think, is at least 10 years old application server. And he had uh, he has bad experience with memory leaks, class loader issues, unclean server state. So usually uh, it works if the wars are implemented in proper way. So of course it is, um, in my opinion, um, almost impossible to, uh, to you know, uh, d uh, deploy a large amount of wars, uh, and 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 every of them, of each of the war has to be perfect. So um, this is the problem that um, it is really hard to implement, you know, perfect uh, applications. And uh, so there is there is where you can run uh, to issues. But um, actually, you could, um, for years or ten years ago, we also ran several years on the application server, or more than ten years ago. So, and now uh, the question is, uh, given that using containers is not currently an option for political reasons, so let's assume guys on Fonta uh, is not able to run Docker, on, uh, there, is, there is no way to run Docker, so let's assume that. So what would be the, best, the next best solution? And um, 
actually, uh, this is actually the killer use case I waited uh, for a long time. I always ask, you know, uh, whenever I had the, uh, the opportunity, you know, what is the killer feature of Fed jars or Uber jars? And uh, it was hard to find any. But I think this is the perfect case to have a Fed jar or Uber jar. I think something like Spring Boot would be perfect because then you can ship one jar, run it, and you can. Um, there is there is no there is no need to separate the uh, business logic from the infrastructure. In your case, you could just you know copy I don't know 100 uh, Fed jars on your server and launch them. And the only issue would be you know um, the port conflicts. So um, if you don't like uh, Spring Boot, uh, because um, yeah, if you don't like Spring Boot, uh, the next uh, thing I would suggest you and uh, probably easier to migrate from Java 6 would be of course something like Quarkus. Um, and we migrated several uh, projects with Quarkus. The only thing is Quarkus is not a Fed jar. It already comes with separated uh, business logic and um, and infrastructure. So you will have to copy a folder. But still, it will be um, the the you know the overhead is negligible. It is tiny. And um, so this I would just migrate your uh, Java E application to Quarkus. And if your server is like WebLogic, could be Helidon. So um, uh, this comes from Oracle. Quarkus is more from, uh, or more is from Red Hat. So there are two interesting frameworks. So um, but this is what I would do. But um, before you do this, I would really you know ask for containers. It doesn't have to be Docker. You could use Rocket or, or Kubernetes. Uh, uh, there is like an OCI. There's a new name for that. So it's Open Container Initiative, I think. There's a new name for that. Um, I forgot the Kubernetes specific API, how to talk to Docker. So, so these days without Docker is... I mean, it's the first time I, I, I see something like this. So I think, um, so this is why, you know, Quarkus is not perfect for, you, for, you, for, your, uh, for your case, but because it already separates the business logic um, and, the, and, the, and the lips and the jars, which is perfect for cloud deployments and not that good if you, you have to deploy on bare metal. Yeah, so that's what, what I will uh, advise you. So um, uh, boots, uh, the bootstrap, um, Spring Boot will be the best solution because it just, you know, you get one huge jar and you can just launch it. And Helidon and uh, and uh, Quarkus already separate the business logic from infrastructure, which is perfect for Docker, Clouds, and Kubernetes. But um, but you will have to ship a a a, a, a um, I would ship a um, a folder which comprises your app and in a lib folder all the dependencies listed. Okay. Uh, now Vagelis asked me searching with as a full text search in my SQL. And um, and he would like to find something with Eclipse Link. And the question is, what you would like to find? Because uh, what you probably need is an index. So you need to to put some metadata in 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 a fully searchable database, and then uh, uh, search for the primary key, or like reverse search, and then use the primary key, and then go to Eclipse Link and fetch the entities. So the question is. Um, do you really need the entity? So uh, if you have, for instance, an Elasticsearch, you can just go straight to Elasticsearch without having JPA or, or entities. And by the way, I used um, Hibernate Search and it worked nice in the past. So it might be an option to use uh, Hibernate Search. So um, I don't know which server you're running, but uh, you could uh, um, you could switch from, for in this case, from Payara to Whitefly, I'd say, and it should work out of the box or um, even Quarkus or something like that. So I'm not sure whether a Hibernate Search runs on Quarkus native no mode, but um, um, I would I would take a look on that. So first I would say, is it really impossible to switch from Eclipse Link to Hibernate in your case? If it is, then uh, if you really would like to stick with Eclipse Link, um, then I would try you know to think, is it possible to separate you know the searchable part from the operational part, and then store the metadata in Elastic. Uh, perform searches in Elastic and then use the IDs to to uh, return the entities, something like that. Uh, it could be reasonable if you have, for instance, a very complex domain uh, object uh, model, um, DOM. And um, yeah, or just say, okay, do I, do I really have to have uh, to go with JPA? I could just use you no know, JSON objects and store them um, with JSON B, for instance, directly in uh, Elastic. What I what I did in my in in, in past. And you could even deserialize from Elastic to JSONB again, and uh, you don't need to have a JPA. So now uh, about JE testing. Uh, by the way, the term JE is that Java is that, and J2 is that. The only thing which we have right now is Jakarta, of course. I checked up 
the test containers to integrate real databases, instances, and not memory databases to our JUnit code as we used to. What's your opinion about this approach? I like the approach, but I, I mean, the approach works, of course. Test containers are interesting, but I, I don't use test containers for test databases. What I do is, if you go to Doclands uh, in my project um, on GitHub, Doclands, you will find a reference to um, to Postgres. It's an older database. I actually wanted to upgrade it today to a new newer version. But this is what I used. Um, so I launched. What I did is I I launched the Postgres database in Docker, and uh, in the Docker script I just loaded the database with test data. And then um, if I removed the database, it was clean. It was always had the initial state. It was very productive to me. So I didn't miss anything. The only thing was I had to reconfigure my application to go against localhost what i do on what i do on openshift is um i use a command called oc uh how port forward i think and um i think it's port forward so i will have to look it up and what you can do is um, you can port you can you can uh uh let's say attached localhost 5432 which i th believe is the port of postgres um, and bind locally and it actually will point to openshift and on OpenShift, um, the same story as in Docker, what we do then is I just redeploy the database. I have a clean, clean, clean state. And you can use Minishift locally. And uh, you can install Minishift, I would say, in it's called OKD or Minishift in, uh, with a decent internet connection in um, five minutes and, um, or 10 minutes. And then you have you know, a local database, which can be, or multiple databases. So in some projects, we even have a one database per developer on OpenShift. Um, so this is what I would look at. For me, it would be the natural approach. You don't need specific tools for that. Now, the C is, um, we have increased max connection in Whitefly data source, but uh, if this number is reached, then Whitefly gives no other connections to other requests. This is true. This is how it's supposed to do. Is What, uh, what a data source is, is a kind of um, a bulkhead pattern. So it prevents you of dying. So if you let's will give uh, give um, Whitefly one hundred thousand connections, it will probably ki kill your machine. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, or we just keep increasing the data source and database max connections, um, and we we can check per corner article about one hundred thousand connections. So um, this is really strange because usually the amount of connection has to be the same as the amount of threats. So if you have 100,000 connections, you will have to, to have 100,000 threats because otherwise, uh, you know, it, it could only work if you have batch processing or something. Because if you, if you think about this, what happens is every request becomes a threat. So it comes from the, uh, from the web or from the web, uh, from the outside, it's HTTP request, and then it's bound to a transaction to a thread. By the way, you have to listen to the uh, PH, uh, from PHP to transactions, AXFM episode. We discussed this, exactly what happens. And um, so you, you bind uh, a thread or a transaction to a thread, exactly. So you need already a thread. So, um, and, and then you hit in one point of time the database. And if you hit the database, if you hit the database, uh, then you will need the connection. So what uh, what assumes uh, the number of processing threads and the number of of uh, database connections has to be equal. And in your case, I don't know what the question is. Um, would you run the application with 100,000 threads? And what I assume is that your application or your database is blocking somewhere, and this is your problem, that it blocks you know, for 10 minutes, and then you need more and more connections. But the question is, you know, what, the, what the, your users are doing because they cannot... Just wait forever. Um, yeah. So, um, the, so you can increase the amount of connections, but usually, you know, anything beyond 30 connections is suspicious, I would say. Okay. Old friend of the show, uh, Mr. Deratzman, asked me, um, we are trying to create a new app with Quarkus. I mean, you will even manage to do this. Uh, it's not that, that hard. Do you have an idea how to store data, data source password in Quarkus? Um, so uh, you, you shouldn't store passwords in Quarkus. If you go to documentation from uh, Agrol Connection Pool, you will see that the passwords can be stored in, uh, in application.properties, but this application or properties can be overridden with uh, environment entries and with system properties. And I think I already did it uh, on, my, on my YouTube channel. And um, yeah, I mean, it works out of the box. And with, yeah, 
So you can you can even have you know a default password for a dev and then override this settings uh, with uh, DC deployment config is called on Kubernetes or just uh, Docker minus E. So it works out of the box. Why it works? Because it's micro profile config. Okay. So uh, now some questions from my blog. Um, Herma F asked me, what's your opinion about Kotlin? I'm using Kotlin in a new project. Um, going right to the point, my core question about the fluid logic uh, pattern. Um, so fluid logic pattern I described in the green book I wrote, I think, 10 years ago or eight years ago. And uh, the idea was uh, what, um, if you, what, what you should do if you would like to replace a piece of code without redeploying. And um, so what I suggested back then is to use JavaScript, NAS1, and I still do it um, and on my block. Uh, but the problem is NAS1 will be um, deprecated. So it won't be a part of JDK. And uh, you could, of course, use uh, GraalVM uh, with uh, Node uh, runtime. But thinking about that, what is very similar to loading code on demand? And I would say uh, serverless. So if you think about this, so all the serverless thing is they load, you know, the, the functions over and over again. So first, so modern approach to fluid logic pattern would be could be, for instance, to 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 ship a uh, a function with custom business logic and call the function by REST. So um, of course you need a serverless infrastructure to do this. But very similar to this is let's say Quarkus. So if you um, what I actually going probably even to do this because I'm using a NAS one in one of my my personal projects right now. And I would like to replace the business logic without uh, affecting the other microservice. And what I will do is I will uh, wrap my business logic with, instead of J JavaScript, just wrap it with regular Java, ship it as a, as a native uh, Quarkus core, just comprising uh, JaxOS and the custom logic in Pojo, Pojo logic. And then I can just you know, replace uh, in a few milliseconds or few seconds the whole kernel and of course, if my service won't find the Quarkus kernel, my microservice uh, is not able to communicate the Quarkus, it will fall back to the default behavior. So I think this is also reasonable. This will be my uh, written approach. Approach, And um, yeah, um, yeah, this is what I will do. Now, um, blog comment by David. And uh, there the, the was about uh, threat safety. And um, so this is the last one. And David clarified statements from Franz, and Franz said uh, that the entity manager is transaction aware, and therefore it should be stateless. And what David said, uh, also entity manager is uh, transaction aware, it is not thread safe because it's in the Oracle tutorial states that. So this is true. So what it basically means is if you will have an entity manager in a singleton, and you will access from multiple threads at the same entity manager, it could become inconsistent. And uh, what's thread safe is the entity manager factory. And therefore, what you will have to do is to create uh, with entity manager factory an own instance from entity manager, um, dedicated entity manager instance per thread, and then it will work. So thank you for the comment on my blog, David. And the next one is um, Alexander, JPA integration test and JPA detection. So go there. And... Uh, what I what I wrote a blog post, an older blog post, how to uh, write integration tests with uh, JPA and Entity Manager, and this is what I still do. Uh, this is exactly the same. And uh, he asked, you know, uh, why I'm doing this? Uh, exclude unlisted classes. True, and I have to list all the classes. And the answer is because I'm running outside of the application server, so I cannot, you know, expect that the uh, Entity Manager, Hibernate, or Eclipse Link will scan my class path and auto-register all the entities, so it won't work. Um, so this was uh, this one. And Kevin. So uh, Kevin Sutter from IBM. So what I wrote is Java is dead, completely dead, of course, because we have Jakarta right now. And what I wrote is that you will find everything except specifications. And what I meant is that um, everything is actually migrated to Jakarta, except uh, there are no new, you know, Jakarta E PDF specification with Jakarta E branding on it. So what we have are the Java EE8 specifications PDFs, which are absolutely compatible with the Jakarta E, but th there are there are no new PDFs. This is what I meant. And um, by the way, uh, take a look at Jakarta E; is really nice. So we have everything in one on one place. So. Um, which is the um, the added value of open source. So now um, 
it is more usable and nicer to access. Okay, so this was from Kevin. Then Stuart asked me, also a nice one. So what I did here, uh, let's say, uh, this one video, launching Java Thin Wars in the clouds. And Stuart said, well, what's the point, you know, uh, adding a stateless on Jaxor's resource? Aren't all requests stateless per default? And, and stateless means EJBs. And what happens behind the scenes is, is not just stateless. What at stateless means is, is like request, co request scoped uh, with pooling and bulkheads plus transactions. This is what happens uh, behind the scenes. And um, because of that, because of the pooling, this at stateless makes all the JaxOS resources even 20% faster. Um, having said that, is probably no more true on Quarkus because uh, Quarkus doesn't use uh, um, uh, reflection for injection. It just generates the bytecode, so I will have to measure once. But uh, I think in uh, Quarkus you could replace at stateless with request scope transactional. So what means you will get two, uh, two uh, annotations instead of one and properly even uh, bulkheads because uh, what you can achieve with that stateless, you can set the max pool size, max pool bean size, and uh, it, will, it will block if it's exhausted. So it's like bulkheads. It's actually, you could have exactly the same behavior then with stateless as we had before with uh, connection pools. Um, you could use that. It's not, um, you know... Uh, um, Popular feature, but I think the most popular one is every public method is transactional, which is nice. And um, in uh, microprofile or Quarkus projects, what we will do, I will probably implement my own uh, stereotype and um, and make it request scoped on transactional. And if stereotypes do not work, I will just put request scope uh, search and replace for stateless and replace that search for stateless and replace that with request scope transactional. Okay, nice. Um, next one. How productive is Quarkus IO in your opinion now? So I migrated my personal projects to Quarkus last week, so it was somehow an uh, important project, and uh, yeah, was very productive. So um, I mean, it worked. So what that, what not always works is the hot reload, which uh, is not a big deal because uh, I just you know killed Quarkus and in one second it was up again, so it doesn't matter. And uh, so it's very productive. It works way better than expected. This is what I can uh, tell you. How would you handle large initial SQL files as initial data with Quarkus? So what it means large? I mean, is your initial, like you have megabytes of, of SQL? Um, I would still know package in, a, in your uh, hollow jar or, or thin jar. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't think you know, of externalizing the SQL uh, first. But um, what, what you could also do, uh, think about this, you could you could have actually another microservice just containing the SQL, and uh, let's say there is uh, something like Startup Singleton, uh, but it's called, uh, I think on Startup, uh, is this like initializer annotation on Quarkus, where uh, it would just initialize your SQL and then deploy your, your microservice. This, this could also work. Yeah, greetings from Germany. Hello. Now, Gassen, chat, chat to uh, chat, you why ask me what is the right approach to interact with a and p broker like rabbit mq in a jakarta jakarta he said jakarta so i would say jakarta is that now we have jakarta already <laughs> that was a nice <laughs> nice typo jakarta e application so uh straight answer gms so um you could uh you can um uh amqp broker um i think something like hive mq um, AM, AMQP ID, I think it's called it's called AMQP Apache something a Cupid, Cupid Apache, and this is like MQTT library I think AMQP and it has a uh, GMS. So uh, the right answer is uh, GMS of course. Uh, GMS two is great. Um, there's one uh, GMS context. Um, with one annotation, you can inject your context, and then with one liner, you can send and receive a message. So it's as, as easy as you can get. So um, it would be really great if you can hack something when you have some free time. So the problem with free time is um, if you are a Java developer, uh, you have no free time. Everything is too exciting. So um, yeah, that's the problem. I don't think uh, I, I, I will get some free time next time. <laughs> so. It, it, the problem is Jakarta gets more and more popular. Microprofile, you know, just goes through the roof. So it's really crazy. 
And by the way, I attended two conferences. One is called uh, JCon. Uh, JCon. Dot, uh, JCon One was the uh, the first one. In uh, and it looked like that, so it was full. And uh, I I gave a keynote and uh, I hacked all the time. I don't know. I didn't hack in the keynote. I hacked afterwards. But I explained um, um, uh, MicroProfile and Jakarta in the relation between both. Got uh, lots of questions. And after the keynote, people come to me again and say, what was it? It was a crazy productive. What is it? And I say, okay, it's called uh, Jakarta. -E. Uh, previously, it was called Java. -E. And um, yeah, so what's, what happens right now is there are young developers. We, we, they, have, um, they never saw you know, the old J2E with XDocLet and interfaces and Corba and IOP and SOAP and ESBs. And uh, if you show them the new stuff, they are really delighted uh, about the productivity. And the crazy stuff, stuff is, at the at same day, there was Java Forum North. Java Forum North, I think. Wait a second. Java Forum North, which North stands for North. And I delivered the closing keynote. It was full again. And I did some hacking with, uh, with Jakarta in MicroProfile. I got a similar feedback. And uh, what, but what's interesting, we have two major, two big conferences in Germany at the same day, you know, and people still saying, you know, uh, Java is dead. And uh, no, <laughs> it's really exciting. So the problem is, you know, Java is too exciting. I have no free time, so don't count on me to show you how to integrate um, RabbitMQ with JMS. But um, I think I, I should do something with JMS because I don't think I recorded anything with JMS so far. So let's see whether we got questions. So no questions here, which is good. Chat is lazy, so no questions here. And uh, no questions here. So I would say thank you for watching and see you next month. It's November. And uh, November already, uh, we have the uh, web workshop. So see you even in person at Munich Airport. And in December, for sure, you know, the backend stuff on the Airport Munich. And I'm about to build my hardware cluster with um, uh, with a small cloud on it. Uh, probably I will bring it with me to the workshop. So thank you and bye.